let's start with conflict of interest disclosure. There is no actual potential conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. Our objective today is will be to discuss the diagnosis of the posterior maxillary region, how to diagnose it, how to get the full image of the case we're dealing with, and following that, the treatment planning for this and the associated grafting procedure that might be needed. Uh, we're going to discuss the different techniques for sinus lifting, the associated complications that, co that are commonly used, and the outcome expected from that. Implant surgery is a surgical procedure that has been modified and simplified uh, by the manufacturers and the industry to make it part of our daily work in our clinics. Years ago, things started that way. It was a huge procedure with multiple surgical approaches to do a heroic pr prosthesis like this one to carry dentures later on. And this started, I think, in the early 50s. And by time, the manufacturers took us to this simple root form implant that we're using nowadays. The posterior maxilla is special in three main things. It has the very poor bone quality, sinus pneumatization, and the insufficient residual alveolar bone height following teeth extraction. Such cases in the posterior maxilla that we don't meet that every day for sure, and whenever we see such a case, we can start it just right now because it's not available anymore in the market. Diagnosis. Comb beam CT have turned the world upside down concerning diagnosis and treatment planning for dental implants because the amount of data that we can extract from this comb beam CT give us the chance to perform our surgery once on our computers before we do it in our patient's mouth. We meet the problems, the complications, we get expected, and we sort a solution for it before that. For the posterior maxillary region especially, we have a lot of data about the available bone height, wet angulation, as well as the sinus anatomy itself, the floor of the, si the maxillary sinus, uh, if it's healthy one with no fluid level, no uh, sinus polyps or cysts, as well as to determine the pathology, like sinus polyps, cyst, fluid level, and sinus obliteration. And my recommendation that we don't deal with any sinus that is diseased. We have to treat this sinus first, then proceed with our sinus lifting procedures. Let's start. Loss of posterior maxilla. This is the only part in my lecture related to trauma or sports injuries. Uh, this patient lost his right posterior maxilla from an old trauma, and as you can see the case, what makes this case a little bit simple is the availability of this thin bony rim between the oral cavity and the sinus cavity that helps us to start our grafting and augmentation on this very thin border. And for those cases, we start with the iliac, we go for the iliac crest, the main store for, of bone that's available in our bodies, we get a bone block, and we place only bone grafts, block grafts, fixed with screws, covered with collagen membranes, and we construct the whole maxillary region. And after a healing period, we can proceed with this case as a regular case after uh, having this amount of bone. And here, in this case, the post operative for this case. There is one plate here on the zygomatic arch because we had a problem with the soft tissue that cannot be uh, managed with an intraoral approach, so we had to take part of the temporalis muscle and break, uh, fracture the zygomatic arch to take this part of muscle inside the mouth to cover all this amount of bone graft. The alternative for, for taking these small bo blocks, to take a one block that uh, resembles the maxillary arch and we fix it as one piece on it, or the last, the last option is using a titanium mesh and particulated bone graft, 50% autogenous and 50% anything else. Same thing applies if we have a localized loss of the posterior maxilla in one or two teeth, we go for bone blocks and fix them according to the defect. If it's a horizontal defect, vertical defect, we can use it on the same way. And in these cases, we prefer to take the anterior border of the ramus because it resembles the crest of the ridge when you apply it for vertical augmentation. Alternatives for this is to use a titanium reinforced collagen membrane or a titanium mesh. And in these two cases, we will use particulate bone graft. That's why we need the titanium reinforced or the titanium mesh itself to keep the shape for this grafting material. As I told you, protocols for implant insertion of the posterior maxillary will help us to have a map to follow during our cases. First, we start with the immediate post-extraction implantation. Uh, we have Fugazuto in 2012. He put a classification for, implant, for immediate implant placement in the posterior maxilla. It's interesting. Uh, his first choice was after extraction to check 
the intercepted bone, the residual intercepted bone available, if it's of a sufficient height, sufficient width, he places the implant inside the intercepted bone. The first time we hear this, we think it's very difficult to see such cases. But in our daily work, when we tried, started to look at the intercepted bone after any extraction, we found that intercepted bone might contain a large amount of bone that can withstand an implant. And this was very clever because he, he made the transmission for this case from an immediate post-extraction case to a regular case because the implant is completely embedded within bone and this was really clever. His second option is when we have sufficient height for the interceptal bone but insufficient width. And in these cases, he go for a condensation of the interceptal bone and placing the implant as well in this place to avoid any complication related to the immediate extraction and having all the implant embedded inside bone. And his third option was the palatal, the palatal root when we have total loss of the interceptal bone. And that's what we used to do usually before thinking of the using the interceptal bone. For implantation, all the extraction sites, we have all the problems. Poor bone quality, and this can be managed by two things. Is to by, sorry, one thing is to condense bone. We can condense this bone using condensers or using an undersized osteotomy and using the implant itself to condense this bone. Uh, actually, we don't change the, the quality of bone in the ridge. We only change, condense a part of bone around our implant to have our implant embedded in much harder bone to have a better primary stability and have a and, and better uh, final outcome. The second thing is the insufficient width. And here we can use everything like ridge splitting, ridge condensation, and the same things. When we have insufficient residual alveolar bone height, Crest resorption is our main problem. Like here in this place, we can see crest resorption because of an old implant that uh, was lost. And we manage this case the same as we managed the things before by block graft, either by block graft or particulated graft with a titanium mesh or titanium reinforced membrane. And here's a case for full arch. We did block grafts and we use the implants themselves to fix those blocks. We place many implants to carry the temporary restoration. And for sure, but in between those blocks, we had to put some particulate bone graft. That's why we used the titanium reinforced collagen membranes, as you can see here. This is to carry to, to keep the shape of the bone around the blocks. The second thing is when we have crest resorption compo combined with sinus pneumatization. Another ca case with this patient had a full arch implants. They, she lost all their implants except these two. And you can see the quality of bone. You can see the insufficient residual alveolar bone height as well. This was a little bit big. This case, after all this resorption, you can see the quality of soft tissue. You can see that this case turned to be a class three case because of the massive resorption that took place in the anterior maxilla. Here we go for some maxillofacial work. We did a fourth one osteotomy to free uh, the maxilla from its basal bone. Then we did the augmentation on top of the maxilla and covered it with uh, collagen membranes, we placed the implants in itself, and we took all the complex and fixed with plates to the basal bone and the immediate temporary restoration. And this is the final outcome. Usually we fix the Lefort one with four plates, but in this case there was no plate for no, no place for extra plating, that's why we only used two plates, and we did splinting for the teeth with the temporary bridge for the implants. <laughs> Maxillary sinus pneumatization, which is the main problem that we see in almost all our cases for the posterior maxilla, and we can see here the amount of pneumatization that took place here. In this particular case, we had that impacted tooth, and we used the bone above it that was going to be removed in any way to graft the sinus and with, with the simultaneous immediate implant placement. What are the treatment options for sinus floor elevation? We have more than one option. We, it can be with simultaneous implant placement or staged with delayed implant placement. We do the sinus lifting and grafting wait for a healing period and then continue for the implantation or we can use it with a bone graft or graftless sinus floor elevation. The protocol uh, says that if residual alveolar bone height was less than three millimeters, then we cannot get initial stability for our implants. And in these cases, uh, we had to do a staged procedure. We do sinus floor elevation at regular open sinus lifting. You all know the technique. We do a lateral window on the posterior maxilla, and we use freers to free the sinus membrane from the sinus bone. In this way, with the, those blunt freers, we lift all the maxillary sinus, place our block 
bone uh, particulated bone graft from, from this window and then insert our implant immediately if we can have initial stability or we can just graft it and postpone the implant for later. Here's different windows. Here's the implant after placement without having bone graft. Here is with bone graft. And this is how we check that the implant in, is intact. This, is, this can only be done when this procedure is done under local anesthesia. Under general anesthesia, the air doesn't come out of the bacteria sinus, so we cannot check. And this is the only reliable check that we did an open sinus lifting and we preserved the maxillary sinus integrity. If we go for a staged approach, like we said before, we do the bone grafting first. And here in this case, we can ensure that the sinus is intact from the smooth upper boundary of the bone. That means that the sinus membrane is lying over this part. If we found those, those bo bone uh, spreading inside the sinus, that means that we have a perforation and the particulated graft run and escape inside the maxillary sinus. And later on, we go for the implant placement. Some cases we have prominent sinus septum. In a very unlucky day, we find this septum protruding in the place we're going to place the implants or we're going to do the sinus lifting. Here we have to do two uh, lateral, bow, lateral windows to approach the maxillary sinus and we lift every window uh, by itself. And we can check it the same way that both windows are intact. This is the only uh, test that we can do intraoperative for this, as we told you. We can preserve this septum to hold the bone in the, these two compartments, or we can fracture this septum afterwards if you are worried that this sharp septum might injure the sinus membrane afterwards. Another case for sinus septum, we do two separate windows, and we can see the bony island inside with the uh, adherent to the maxillary sinus. The maxillary sinus is very forgiving. Anything placed inside it will give us bone. And uh, that's why whenever we see a uh, representative telling, talking about his bone graft, we can see a photo for a sinus lifting case. Everything worked inside the maxillary sinus. Autogenous bone was the, was the gold standard for years. BioOS later on did the same results. Actually putting nothing and leaving the blood clot only inside the maxillary sinus, it gives the same results and what's, that's what's called graftless sinus lifting. We can do it with implant placement simultaneous or as a separate stage. Later on, we, they started to use uh, PRF, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So everything worked inside the maxillary sinus for grafting. This is the graftless sinus lifting and you can see the blood filling the whole cavity around the implants afterwards, as you can see the result. And another stage for graftless sinus lifting was to lift the sinus and place some uh, hardware to, f to fit, fix this sinus on this level and leave the cavity to be filled with blood. We can use titanium screws, or, and you can see on the CT, or we can use titanium mesh. And here is a case after six months of graftless sinus lifting with the mesh and the, the amount of bone we, we gained. I think this slide changed a lot of my practice on the, the idea of grafting the maxillary sinus. The complications we usually meet in the maxillary sinus is perforation in the maxillary sinus. It can be in the lining itself. It can be during the lifting procedure or during the implant placement itself. And it can be easily managed by just placing uh, an insulating or isolating medium between the maxillary sinus and bone graft <laughs> underwear. It can be a collagen membrane, alloderm, uh, PRF. Everything worked here just to isolate the compartment, compartment of the maxillary sinus from the graft material underneath. Alternatives for this, uh, for this treatment are either zygomatic implants. They're not that much available in our market or the Olum 4 technique as discussed before. And the final alternative are short implants. You know, Straumann have uh, had a uh, scientific day, I think two years ago, talking about their short implants and how much you, you decrease the stress on the doctors by avoiding any extra procedures and decreasing the time of surgery. It has many, many advantages. And the revolution that took place in the surface treatment of these implants made, made those short implants capable of performing the same thing as the longer ones. And for, for sure you know that the crown root ratio we use, or uh, we think of in teeth, is not applied for implant dentistry. Back to our protocol, if the residual alveolar bone height, more than four millimeters, this means we can place the implant simultaneous. We need a little bit of space, but we can place our implant simultaneous. The first thing to do in these cases is closed sinus lifting, but I think closed sinus lifting is a crippled technique. 
because it's a blind technique. You cannot make sure that this sinus is intact or not. If you're using the closed sinus lifting with a particulate bone graft material, this means that if you had a, a small perforation, it will, you cannot manage it. The bone will escape inside the sinus. Maybe you cannot place your implant, yes, but you know this is an infected sinus that will need a minimum of three to four months to resolute this infection before you proceed with the procedure again. That's why we think that closed sinus lifting is a little bit crippled technique. The technique for sure, as you know, we do crest it's a crestal approach to the sinus and then we leave a thin ridge of bone and then we start either by a balloon or a osteotome to break this, fracture this part of bone and lift the maxillary sinus. In the diagram, it looks very logic, but when you do it by your hand and we do it, when you do the, the open sinus lifting procedure, you know that this is only a dream. This can't be happen. You cannot fracture this part of bone and push it that way and reflect all this intact maxillary sinus without a perforation, this will not happen in every case. You might do it in, in a case, but it will not be the protocol for every case. And this is how it looks in the diagram and in the x-ray. This is the only evidence that this sinus is intact, but if you didn't place bone, you will not be sure whether this sinus membrane is intact or it's perforated. Professor Schlegel from the University of, uh, of Nuremberg is one of my professors. He did a study on implants protruding inside the maxillary sinus. He's a maxillofacial surgeon, and he took that view for this case. Professor Schlegel, uh, he started to think about the cases of maxillary trauma. In cases with uh, maxillary trauma or deformed fractures or so on, we use plates and fix them on the facial, part, fa facial surface of the maxilla. Those screws that are placed here are protruding inside the maxillary sinus. They are titanium screws introduced inside the maxillary sinus, perforating the maxillary sinus, and we never had a case of Lefort osteotomy that had a problem in their sinus because of these screws. This never happened in our practice. That's why he took this idea. You can here see this is the plates, this is the titanium screw protruding inside, and this is a super healthy sinus. Maybe here is a bony specule from the trauma, but we don't see any thickening of the membrane, no fluid level, no infection, and clinically there is no pus. He took this idea and tried to apply it on the, for implant dentistry. But he put two rules. First of all, we have to be dealing with a healthy sinus. It cannot be a diseased sinus. And the second thing is initial stability. What Professor Schlegel do is that when he needs to protrude his implant for five millimeters inside the maxillary sinus, he just perforated the maxillary sinus with his first drill. And afterwards, he used, for this technique, it's better to use it with a tapered bone level implants to be able to engage the bone and use the undersized otiotomy technique. Here we can go for a minimum of 35 newtons for initial stability for this implants. If you can reach the 35 newtons either by undersized osteotomy or bone condensation, and you know this is the healthy sinus, this is a very reliable technique. Maybe uh, it's not taking its part. You don't hear this so too many times in conferences because this is not, there is no something here that the companies are going to sell. We're not talking about kits. We're not talking about bone grafts. We're not talking about collagen membranes. It's not so much appealing for the industry to support such thing. In our practice, we have did this for long years, and things are going very, very fine. If you have a healthy sinus, and you know that from your experience, you can reach the 35 newtons or more, I promise you it has very good results. All these cases have been made in the same way. These implants all are introduced inside the maxillary sinus, and they have been followed up for a minimum of eight years, and we have no problems. I have a record of 240 cases of implants introduced inside the maxillary sinus for about, for a maximum of six millimeters, and I've never had a problem with that. The only problem comes when you feel that you got a bit stronger, and you start to do this in an unhealthy sinus, you start to do this with an unstable implant, this, this is where the failure comes, but following these rules is very stable. Initial stability, I think it's one of the most important keys of success in our work. When I started my career 14 years ago, we didn't have those fancy tools. In 2009, it was my first time to use an adjustable torque crunch to insert my implant, and it was the first time to find a, a way of speaking with my team about my cases. When I had a case, I don't tell them I had a good initial stability. I had the best initial stability. We turned this to a numerical value. I said I placed my implant on 35 newtons, 40 newtons, and so on. So it made things easier. And it helped me to decide when I'm going to load these implants. When I go for 40, 50 newtons for the initial stability of these implants, I start to load them 
after six to eight weeks, when I'm down to 35 newtons, I postpone this for three months. And if it's much lower, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to continue my surgery in the same way. I'm going to remove this implant immediately during my surgery and insert another wider diameter implant to make sure that I go back to my minimum of, of 35 newtons. Later on, the OSTEL came on. The, the OSTEL helps a lot in so many cases, but actually it's not 100% reliable. You, as you, anybody who tried the OSTEL, he will know that it has its pitfalls that makes it, it's not that reliable, but this torque wrench, you feel it by your hand, this stability, and it never fails. Taking the initial stability as a gold standard, the literature started to talk about implant inserted in chronically infected site. As you can see, the infection from this molar and here from these premolars in the comb beam CT, you can see the amount of chronically infected tissue available. There are lots of protocols on how to deal with this infection, surgical curettage, uh, drilling the bone, uh, irrigation with different solutions and so on. But to be able to insert the implant immediate, you have to be sure that you can reach the, initial, the, the 35 newtons or more to preserve this. Using this initial stability helps us to place our implants in chronically infected site without added complications for this. Thank you very much, and I would like to receive any questions. Thank you very much. Fantastic lecture. Thank you. Uh, can I just ask you about your experience with block grafts? Um, I'm a big fan of them as well, but I wanted to ask you what is your experience using fenestrated versus non-fenestrated block grafts? Uh, Have you tried experimenting between these two to see I, I if one of them integrates better than the other? I didn't do a research on this point specifically, but I can share my technical experience with you regarding this. Uh, actually, fenestrating the bone, the bone block is not of that value because this bone block is an autogenous block. It's a fresh block. It has a spongy side, so it's fenestrated enough. We don't need to fenestrate it more. This might be of value if I'm using a cortical block. Yeah. But a, a cortical can sell this block. It's fenestrated enough from the, from the cortex side, so we, we do, don't do fenestration in this part. We do fenestration in the bed itself, in the, uh, the bed that's going to receive this block to make sure that there is enough blood supply coming from the bed to this block to help the take of this block and so on. And what about the cortical? Only the cortical blocks might be, and, uh, but actually, to tell you the truth, th these cortical blocks, they never resorb. They, they stay for long for resorption. Okay. So I, I don't get an added value of fenestrating this. Uh, sometimes they are very thin when we use them like in Hori technique and so on. So I don't, don't, don't want to weaken them with these fenestrations. We, the, my screws that I use to fix these blocks are weakening these blocks enough. Sometimes yeah. you can see cracks in these blocks while screwing them in. And that's why I'm not a big fan of uh, fenestrating my blocks. I fenestrate the bed well but I don't fenestrate my blocks. That, that's exactly what I do as well, but I've read recently somebody putting a research that if you fenestrate the, the, cortic, yeah. the cortex itself, it becomes quicker and fully more integrated, and if you don't, you get uh, a, fibrous, uh, a fibrous interface between both of them, which I never found in any of my cases That's what before. I'm going to tell you. If it's in your hands, the, your technique is going well, don't change it. There is no need to change it. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much for Thank your you. lecture. Um, my question is, um, I believe the, the, the goal of uh, insertion the implant inside the sinus is to get the benefit of fixation at the floor of sinus, By to engage the implant in the floor of sinus. So. What is the benefit to put the implant four or five millimeter inside the sinus while we can keep it only one to two millimeter? What is the okay. benefit of this implant in the air? This takes me back to 2007. I was having my training in Erlangen, Nuremberg University in Germany. And I was attending in the private clinic there with uh, Professor Schlegel. He entered the room for two implants, upper four and five. He drilled. The patient was anesthetized and the, the doctor stayed in the room for a maximum of three minutes. He went inside, flapless. He drilled 
through the bone, and you can see the drop inside the maxillary sinus in both. And at that age, uh, Stauman implants were supplied with only three uh, disposable drills, if you remember. So he used only one drill, dropped inside the sinus in both of them, and he inserted his implants, and he got out. That's why I go after him and ask, this can't be happening. This is a, cr a crime I've seen. He discussed the options, and the technique, in his words, is that after, after the osteotomy preparation, you have a lot of blood and a lot of bony partic particles inside this osteotomy. When the implants start to be inserted inside, the implants get soaked with blood and carry some of these very fine bony particles inside. And then it starts to protrude inside the maxillary sinus. Titanium covered with a layer of blood with some small bony particles with a 35 millimeters initial stability. This means that this structure inside the sinus is very, very stable. During the healing period, the sinus heals all over the implant. And in a two years follow-up for these cases, for my cases, I've seen that, you can see a very thin rim of bone around the implant. It's not the implant inside the maxillary sinus. Moreover, I had one patient of those who had a chronic sinusitis three years later. When he went to his dentist, he told, me, told him, maybe this implant and go back to the dentist. When he visited my clinic, I referred him back to the ENT and told him, proceed with forget about the implant and proceed with your work. What happened is that uh, the ENT specialist went inside the sinus with their scope and he cannot see the titanium. He can see an intact sinus membrane just bumping in this area around the implant, but it's completely intact. When you have an implant protruding inside the sinus, you can see the titanium very well in the scope. It's not to be missed. So his theory was have protruding inside the sinus two millimeters or four, he goes for the four, for the future bone formation around this implant. It's not very much convincing, but sometimes you don't feel happy inserting a six millimeters implant or an eight millimeters implant. Maybe you'll feel more comfortable. I am from this school. I, love, I used to love longer implants, wider diameter implants, in, like the old era. So that's why I feel more comfortable, even when doing this technique, to insert a, just a minimum of 10 millimeters implant to carry a molar in. That's my. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.